Well, I direct your attention to the New Testament reading which we had from Romans chapter 1 and focusing on verse 16. Paul's words, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This text has been on my mind for several days during the month of August, particularly because of the 450th anniversary of the St. Bartholomew Massacre, which took place in Paris and elsewhere in France in 1572, and that horrific butchering by Roman Catholics of French Protestants, the Reformed Churches of France. And there's no doubt when you investigate the history of that momentous uh, era that what encouraged them to stand firm for the gospel was the same truth that Paul expresses here in Romans 1 verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I believe that we need to recover that sense of not being ashamed of the gospel because it's only when we have that spiritual conviction that we can expect the gospel to make a difference to the world in which we live. And when you think the Apostle Paul was writing these words to that new church in Rome, they'd come to the profession of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and there they were in the centre, so to speak, of the empire, the imperial city, which was famous or rather infamous for its pride and its arrogance, its power uh, over the nations of the earth. And it was no small thing for this little Jewish man who used to be Saul of Tarsus, now Paul the Apostle, to write such a challenging message which was the very antithesis of everything that Rome stood for. There's a sense in which Rome was described in the latter part of Romans 1. The uh, idolatry, the wickedness, the immorality, the violence, the perversity that Paul um, itemizes in great detail uh, in, that, in that chapter. So for Paul to write those things would have required uh, great courage. He was a marked man because the Christians in Rome, when the elders would have read the letter to the congregation, they would have understood not only what the gospel is, but what the gospel is in relation to the culture in which they were living. And therefore, as they were to witness to Christ and the gospel in their community, they could expect trouble, the kind of trouble which eventually, of course, led to Paul's own martyrdom in Rome. So there's a, a very powerful message here, I believe, for us at the, at the present time. So really, Paul writing to this proud empire, you'll notice that he does use the word, doesn't he, uh, in uh, the latter part uh, of, of the chapter. He describes those who, in verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud. And it was, pride was the symptom of their atheism, of their arrogance, their rejection of the Judeo-Christian living God, uh, whom Paul uh, represented. And therefore, we can see the contrast between, if you like, Roman pride and what I would call Christian pride. If I was to give a title to my message this morning, it is very simply the case for Christian pride. Because Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. He contrasts there the power of Rome 
and the power of God. The power of Rome, which ultimately leads to death, and the power of God, which ultimately leads to salvation. And it's important that we understand it with that sort of contrast. Not surprisingly, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in one of his early uh, sermons after coming to Westminster Chapel, published as The Plight of Man and the Power of God, Exposition of Romans chapter 1, this is what he said, uh, that Paul, concerning the gospel, Paul is proud of it. He glories in it. He boasts of it and exults in it. And there you can see that Dr. Lloyd-Jones is recognising the fact that uh, words can have a specific meaning, but they can also have a relative meaning, which uh, leads to synonyms in, in, a, in a language. In other words, although Paul mentioned pride as an evil thing in the last part of Romans 1, yet there is a sense in which pride, properly defined, can also be a Christian virtue in the sense that Paul speaks and that Dr. Lloyd-Jones uh, expounds it. Now, some weeks ago, I had a very interesting uh, email discussion with a very dear Christian friend in Texas. And uh, we were discussing the use of words, and he was arguing that the word pride should never be used in a Christian context. And I tried to explain that... Um, there's a good case for uh, asserting what Dr. Lloyd-Jones expressed uh, in that sermon. Because the reason why the word pride is given a negative connotation so often in the Bible is because what people are proud of. And it's that that makes it objectionable to Christians. The whole idea of, of pride is something objectionable. For example, in Proverbs chapter 8... And verse 13, we read, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. And that surely summed up what Paul was saying of Rome. And that's why they were ultimately foolish. They were not wise, they were foolish. Which is exactly what Paul said, that those who, who thought they were wise became themselves fools. And then again in Proverbs 16, verse 18, we read this. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Pride goes before destruction. And we know that 400 years later, after Paul wrote that epistle, in the year 410, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths from northern Europe, they invaded um, Italy, and Alaric the Ostrogoth sacked Rome in the year 410. And it was those events that led to the departure of the Roman legions from all over the outposts of the empire, including um, this country as well. So indeed, it really is the case that pride goes before destruction. For history does bear out uh, the truth of God in a most uh, remarkable way. And then, of course, we know very effectively from uh, the prophet Jeremiah of the kind of virtues that the Lord himself uh, commends and promotes uh, in human hearts and lives. That famous passage which we know and love so well in Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So uh, people who rejoice in, in, in these things are the people in whom the Lord delights. And the language there, which is translated uh, as glory, is another sort of synonym for pride in a positive definition, which is precisely what 
And Dr. Lloyd-Jones says that Paul was proud of the gospel. He glories in it. He boasts of it and exults in it. So yes, we can say that uh, someone who is always boasting is not a very pleasant kind of person uh, to enjoy his company. But the reason why it's negative is, is when they boast in the wrong things. They, they boast in themselves, or they, they boast in their football team, or they boast in this, that, and the other. But there's a sense in which we as Christians ought to be proud, as Paul is, proud of the gospel, proud of the Lord Jesus and what he has done for us, proud in everything that is virtuous, which is surely what Paul means in Galatians 6.14 when he says, God forbid that I should boast save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we could say that Paul was a boaster, but not in himself as he once was as a Pharisee, but he was now a boaster in Jesus, a boaster in the cross, a boaster in the gospel. So it's helpful, I believe, to see the way that these words are, are used. And uh, it's in that sense, of course, that when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, which was full of a lot of human boasting, a lot of human pride because of their Greek legacy, because they boasted of their wisdom, their philosophers, their um, Plato's and their Aristotle's and their Socrates and, and uh, the Stoics and the Epicurean. That, that was the thing, that was the chief pride of the Greek world. But that coexisted with a great moral decadence. Again, the same kind of thing that we read of in Romans chapter, chapter 1. So it's important, therefore, for us to understand precisely what Paul is, is saying here. So he's really saying um, something like this. Uh, you Romans, you, you, you boast, you're proud of your power and of your influence, your control over all the nations of the earth. But I want to tell you, he's really saying, that I am proud of my Saviour. I am proud of my Gospel. I am proud of the Word of God. And your power will lead you to destruction. But the power that I represent leads to salvation. So we have that black and white contrast when we think of it in these, in these terms. Now, having said all this, it's also reminding us of how words can be not only used, but also abused, even hijacked. Um, you, you will have noticed, I'm sure, that in our Old Testament reading from Proverbs, we have this important uh, statement. Um, verse 6, Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things, for my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Now that explains why we should have a very careful understanding of words because they can be used and they can be abused. Now when I say that uh, my message could be entitled The Case for Christian Pride, some people might wince at that. Oh dear, that sounds rather suspicious as if I'm advocating some kind of uh, Christian version of the gay pride movement. Well of course, as I will reinforce, it's the very opposite of that that I am arguing from Paul's words with this suggestive thought of of, of Dr. Lloyd-Jones, but when you think that um, how words are, are, are abused, you might have noticed, I'm sure, if you look at the old movies, the old black and white movies, that um, the word gay uh, often crops up. And the original use of the word is someone who is, who is cheerful and, and bright. Um, gaiety was that kind of outlook. It was something delightful. It was pleasant rather than to be morose and to be, and to be, to be miserable and to be dull. And that was a perfectly innocent use of the word gay. But you know how it's been perverted by the um, homosexual um, com community. And uh, I've never forgotten that there was a lovely Christian lady who used to worship in Great Ellingham. She lived in Hingham. 
and her Christian name was Gay. And um, when I was thinking about the way words can be abused and, and hijacked for, a, for a, an evil purpose, I could imagine a scenario which, if, if in later years, if I was visiting Hingham and perhaps went into the post office or the chemist there and bumped into this lady, uh, if there were a crowd of people there and I saw her and said, and me trying to remember her name, I said, oh, you're gay, aren't you? If I'd have said that in the hearing of those people, well, you'll know by today's values and use of language how they would have understood my statement, which in and of itself is perfectly innocent and perfectly pure. And that's, that's what's happened in our, in our culture. And uh, we ought to resist that rather than let perversity take over our language. And I think we should recover what is true and what is, pu what is pure. And uh, when one thinks that those early Christians in Rome, uh, when you think that their background was the kind of background that Paul describes in such vivid detail in the latter part of chapter 1, that would have been their background, those Christians. As at Corinth, we know from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, we have a, a hint of the kind of corrupt background of the Corinthian Christians. Likewise, these Roman Christians, they would have known the experience and the lifestyle that Paul identifies there. But that was now left behind. And now as Christians, uh, having turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord, rejoicing that their sins were forgiven through trusting in his precious blood. They knew that they had to witness as light bearers for Jesus in a very dark culture. And that would have meant for them, it would, would have been a challenging thing. And when you think that um, for those Christians uh, to have come from a pagan background, to have heard the gospel and to have professed the faith, how would they have expressed their faith publicly? By baptism. Because that is what happened uh, in th those early, early centuries. So think of another example when people, whenever they wish to declare their sexual orientation, they come out, don't they? Some celebrity, some sports star. But there's a very sense, a very real sense, and we as, we, are, we as Christians ought to be free to use that word. But how many times do you hear in the media, oh, I've come out, meaning I've become a Christian? But that's a perfectly valid way of describing it. And that's exactly what baptism would have meant to people with a pagan background. They would have come out for Christ. So I think there's a sense in which um, uh, we can use that word to great gospel effect, to avoid the perversion and adulteration of words. So it's important that we, we think about these things in the light of what the Apostle says. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. So I, I, he says, I'm not humiliated by either my little physical height, because Paul was a very little man, a short man. I'm not intimidated by the things I believe in the face of, of Roman philosophy and government and religion. No, I'm, I'm tremendously proud of what I represent. Tremendously proud of the one whom I represent, my living Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he speaks of those things. And this teaching, and then all the teaching that Paul expresses in the epistle, that would have strengthened the Christians in Rome. And they, with their unique opportunity, they would have, through their personal context, their business context, their legal context, even their military context, because they would have been Roman soldiers who would have been converted, that they would have been buoyed up by not only the teaching of the gospel in Romans, but also the spirit with which the teaching was to be experienced and lived out. Because Paul not only expressed truth for the mind, but truth to be loved. And when that truth is loved, it will be lived and make an impact. And that's what the Apostle Paul is really saying there. In other words, you couldn't hide the Apostle Paul because he was not ashamed 
of the gospel. Now let me then make two main points at this stage. And to say, first of all, that there is a case to be made for shame. A case to be made for shame. And secondly, a case for Christian pride. So first of all then, a case for shame. And Paul uses that expression, doesn't he, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 21. Romans 6 and verse 21, where he's talking about uh, a Christian who is now no longer a slave to sin, but in a very real sense, a slave to Jesus Christ. He explains that in verses 15 following. And of course, slavery was an infamous tool of the Romans to build their empire. And Paul uses that analogy to say, well, the, way, the reason why the world is as it is because we are slaves of sin. But when you're delivered from the slavery of sin, you come under a new master. You come into a new slavery. A slavery which is not full of cursedness, but full of blessedness. So he says then, verse 15, that shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, whether of sin to death, or of, of obedience to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms, so he's using the analogy of slavery to make a gospel point. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. And this is the verse I want to underline. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So he's saying, you Christians in Rome, you're converted now, you're born again, you're Christian subjects or slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the, the style of life that you left behind, you're ashamed of that, aren't you? You now glory in Jesus. You boast in Jesus. And I think he would say, uh, as I'm not ashamed of Christ, so you're not ashamed of Christ. As I'm proud of Jesus, so you're proud of Jesus. But there are things in your background of which you are justly ashamed, but you rejoice in the pardon of God that has delivered you from that guilt and from that shame. And therefore, when he wrote those words, the things of which you are now ashamed, he's obviously referring back to that ugly list at the end of Romans 1. That was their background. But now they have a new master. They have a new king. And they are justly, happily, wonderfully, cheerfully chained to Jesus. Because it's a slavery which is perfect freedom, as has been, has been said. So that is what the Apostle Paul is, is saying, saying here. And if Paul is describing the Romans, I think there's a very real sense in which he would have included himself. Because at the end of Romans 7, and you'll be familiar with this, Romans 7 verse 24 where he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body, this body of death? So he viewed himself. In very similar terms, he says, is that I by nature am a wretched man. I'm a wicked man by nature. I too have a wicked past. Not quite the same as the ugliness of the Romans or the Greeks, but in terms of self-righteousness, 
He knew that he was like the Pharisees whom Jesus so often exposed, that they were like whited sepulchres, but inside are full of dead men's bones. There was death as well as wickedness in the hearts of the Pharisees as well as the Romans. Paul says, that was my background. I, by nature, apart from the grace of God, am a wretched man, a wicked man. And I believe that every true Christian ought to have that self-awareness. And we're able to do so because of what he goes on to say in verse 25 of Romans 7. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you'll see the question that he posed, who will deliver me from the body of this death? That's the question. What's the answer? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. In other words, the battle goes on. Because all those tendencies within our wicked hearts by nature, they're not completely removed. They're not completely deleted. Yes, we're pardoned from the guilt of them as we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're progressively delivered from the, from the consequences of them in time and in eternity. So sanctification is a progressive thing. But day by day, we're trusting in a Savior who washes us clean from sin. So yes, that is the view that we ought to have of ourselves. So there is a case to be made for a sense of shame. It ought to be a feature, it ought to be an aspect of Christian experience, that sense of shame. I often wonder whether there are some Christians who are a bit too cocky in their whole demeanour. There ought to be a sense of well, I don't forget what I was, although I do rejoice in what I now am. There is a place for a sense of shame, which coexists with a sense of thanksgiving in what Jesus has done. And examples of this are found in Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 14. Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 14 where Paul says, And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. There is a place for people being ashamed. And in that particular context, and it would apply to people who heard Romans read, but didn't like it, they might have liked this chapter and not the other chapter and pick and choose. But uh, Paul had to say, if there are those who do not obey the word of God in this letter that I'm writing, note that person, don't keep company with him because if you keep close company and fellowship with the wrong kind of professing Christians, they could lead you astray. They could lead you to adopt a disobedience in line with their disobedience. So he says, that he may be ashamed. And uh, it's interesting, the Greek word here, there are several Greek words used, uh, which we translate as shame. And one word means uh, to turn against oneself. To turn against oneself. Um, having a wholesome sense of shame. As a Bible dictionary explains. And uh, we have an example of that in Titus 2 and verse 8. Titus 2 and verse 8. And I'll read from verse 6. Titus 2 verse 6. Likewise exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. So in other words, so profess and live the Christian life that those who object and who challenge you will be silenced into shame, a sense of shame. Now that is the kind of thing that ought to be a byproduct of our Christian witness among people who are 
proud of their wickedness, proud of their sin, and proud of their of what they boast in. So there is indeed a very powerful case to be made for a sense of shame. So you and I ought to, and I'm sure we do, we look at our lives and we examine them. Things that we have said, have done in the past, have not said and have not done when we ought to have done. And uh, we don't just say, well, that's okay, that's in the past. There are certain things in your life which I'm sure make you ashamed. There are things in my life which make me ashamed, and I regret that they ever happened. But of course we don't wallow in shame in the sense that, well, there is an answer. Jesus is the answer. The grace of God is the, is the answer. And there's another interesting use which links up to what I've said earlier. Because, you see, if you're ashamed of something, you're not going to go public about it, are you? You aren't going to make much of it and tell the world about things that you're ashamed. What people who are ashamed of something is that they're normally silent about it. They keep quiet about it, something that they're ashamed of. And that's why an interesting statement, again by Paul, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. And this undoubtedly links up with what Paul had said in Romans 1 about the sexual perversion, the homosexuality, which was a feature of Roman society. Mind you, uh, it was never legalized in Rome in the way it is in Western culture. Now, we are worse than the Romans were in that respect. But look what Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So shame and secrecy are there linked in the thinking of the Apostle Paul, which makes the current use of pride so objectionable, because there are people that are so proud of their sexual perversion and practices, they're no longer ashamed of it. They're proud of it. And because they're proud of it, they go public about it. And that's one of the features that we're facing at the, at the present time. So there is a case for making people feel ashamed of their sin, whatever sin that might be, in order then to bring us to repentance, to bring us to, to turn in upon ourselves, as the Greek word means, and then to turn against ourselves, not to justify ourselves or to make excuses for ourselves, but to own up, to come out, as it were, and say, yes, I am a sinner and I need a saviour. And that saviour is my Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who delivers me from this wicked mess that is my nature. There is a place for shame in our Christian experience. But this coincides, it coexists with the second emphasis that I make now, uh, the case for Christian pride. Yes, you see, in other words, again, it links up with the Gay Pride Month and so forth, that whenever uh, the Gay Pride people are active, what do they do? They go public. They have their parades. When you're proud of something, you aren't secret about it. You're, you go public about it. You make it known. And what Paul is saying here is that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm proud of the gospel. So I, w I want to bring the gospel message right to the center of the empire, right to you people in Rome. And I want you to be not ashamed of the gospel either because the word needs it, because the word is coming under the judgment of God. And the only way that Christians will make an impact is when they're not ashamed of the gospel. And they are as proud of our Saviour as these people are proud in their arrogance. That is the great difference. So it is shame 
that leads to secrecy. One thinks, for example, of Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. And we wonder what happened to Nicodemus. But we do know that he assisted Joseph of Arimathea, didn't he? In the care of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told in John's Gospel of Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus has been described as a secret disciple. We know nothing more about him in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we'd like to believe the best that he really did come to love the Lord Jesus as surely Joseph of Arimathea did, together with the others. But uh, there is just that question hanging over his memory. Nicodemus, the secret disciple. But you really can't continue indefinitely as a secret disciple because either the discipleship will kill the secrecy or the secrecy will kill the discipleship. In other words, if you're going to be a Christian like Paul, if you're going to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, you can't be secret about that. You've got to be public about that. And I fear that whilst the world is, 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 is public in its shame, uh, why are Christians not known to be proud of what we believe, which is the only answer? In that sense, I believe that Christianity in, in the United Kingdom, to go no further, has become such a, a feeble representation of what Paul is saying here. And those early Christians, of course, who for three centuries were persecuted in the Roman Empire, because they were not ashamed. Where there, are, where there is persecution in the time of the Huguenots, it was because they were not ashamed of Jesus. Where there are persecutions now in Africa and India and elsewhere of Christians, it's because they're not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul did say, didn't he, to Timothy, that they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if we never have any kind of trace of persecution, how real, how, how thick is our godliness? Is it just skin deep or is there some substance to it? This is the challenge I find uh, about um, all this. So there is a case for Christian pride, the antidote to being ashamed. I think again of one of the early Methodists in the time of George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers, called John Berridge. He was the vicar of Everton in Bedfordshire. And like John Wesley, he was ordained before he was converted. But when he was truly converted and born again, his life was transformed. But um, as he went on his pastoral visits in the area, uh, he would ride back to the rectory, back to the vicarage rather, and uh, he would pass along the street, the high street in Everton, and there was a particular man who, who took great delight in heckling passers-by. And uh, he was a heckler of religious people. And John Berridge saw him in, a, in the distance. But there was a side street that he could come round the back and avoid where the man was standing. So he did that. But as, he, as his horse turned into the side street and down parallel to the, to the high street, that heckler spotted the vicar doing that. And he was waiting for him as he turned the corner. And as he came round on his horse, the man said, Ah, you're ashamed on it, are you? And that shook John Berridge to the core, that he was ashamed of what he represented. He was ashamed of being a Christian minister. He couldn't stand up to the heckler. Well, later things changed when he came to a saving experience of the Lord Jesus. And he exchanged religion for Christianity. And he said, once Jesus Christ was my walking stick. But now he's my whole crutch. In other words, he led completely and entirely 
upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He was like Paul who said in Galatians 6.14, uh, God forbid that I should boast save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was a boaster. He was proud of Christ. He was proud of the gospel. He gloried. He exulted in the Lord Jesus as Lord Jones uh, made explain. So you see what shame says is be quiet. So silent Christians, silent churches, silent Christianity argues that we're ashamed of the Bible, ashamed of God's word, ashamed of the gospel. And that is absolutely shameful, isn't it? We ought to be public about our faith, as Paul is, as the best Christians of the ages have always been. Because if you try to hide your discipleship, that's a bad state. And whenever the church has shown growth within a community, when a wicked society has been transformed by the grace of God, it's because Christians were not ashamed. They were Romans 1.16 Christians. And I do believe that that's got what we have got to recover. We've got to be among those who will say, yes, I glory in nothing but my Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. I have so much to be ashamed of in my own life, but every reason not to be ashamed of him, because he is the solution to all the wickedness and the corruption and the foulness and the pride and the arrogance in my nature, which will lead me to death. But Jesus has come to save me from all this, and therefore he is the one in whom I boast. And that's why I think that beautiful hymn by Joseph Grigg, it really does sum up in a very full and vivid way uh, so many of these thoughts. And this is what he said, Jesus, and shall it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee? Ashamed of thee, whom angels praise, whose glories shine through endless days. Ashamed of Jesus, of my God, who purchased me with his own blood, of him who, to retrieve my loss, despised the shame, endured the cross. Ashamed of Jesus, that dear friend, on whom my hopes of heaven depend. No, when I blush, be this my shame, that I no more revere his name. I find that such a challenging couplet. No, when I blush, be this my shame, that I no more revere his name. Ashamed of Jesus, yes I may, when I've no guilt to wash away, no tear to wipe, no goods to crave, no fears to quell, no soul to save. Ashamed of Jesus, of my Lord, by all heaven's glorious hosts adored, no, I will make my boast of thee in time and in eternity. Till then, nor is my boasting vain. Till then I boast a saviour slain. Oh, may this my glory be, that Christ is not ashamed of me. Now in the light of our text and this whole subject, and I trust and the themes I've tried to bring out, I think that hymn really says everything, doesn't it? But there is a very powerful verse, which in a sense uh, anticipated Pope Paul's Romans 1.16, which is reflected in that final verse of Joseph Grigg's hymn. And the verse, of course, that I mean is found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. It anticipates Romans 1.16. Mark 8, verse 38. Jesus said, Well, let's read from verse 34 to the end of the chapter. 
which is headed here with take up the cross and follow him. And when he had called the people to him with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then the key verse, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Notice, whoever is ashamed of me and my words. If you like, that's a summary of Paul's letter to the Romans concerning which he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So I think there's a very powerful case to reflect in great depth on Joseph Griggs' hymn. Ashamed of Jesus of my Lord, by all heaven's glorious host adored, no. I will make my boast of thee in time and in eternity. Till then, nor is my boasting vain. Till then, I boast a saviour slain. Oh, may this my glory be, that Christ is not ashamed of me. So I hope I've made the case, the case for Christian pride, properly understood against all the perversions of language that we're so wearied of in our culture, so that the truth of God might prevail in our souls and drive us to make an impact for our Saviour, not just for his glory, but for our good and for the good of others, because they need what our message is. We don't need what they're proud of, but they do need what we're to be proud of. So, may the Lord send such a revival and reformation that these things will be so powerful to make the kind of impact upon a wicked world that the early church did and in the time of the Huguenots and the Reformation and other times too. Let's pray to that end, to his glory and our eternal blessing. Amen.